We'll go till about nine o'clock, a little, a, and a little earlier than last night. Uh, and we'll take questions and so on. But I thought to begin with a meditation. Um, someone came up to me after, you know, before dinner, after we finished, um, asking a, a question that I thought was, would be relevant for more than just him, uh, which was, uh, in one breath I was saying, don't, don't sit cross-legged until you blow out your knees, so don't, don't just stay with the pain forever. But then in the next breath I was saying, uh, go into whatever the emotional pain is and use it as, a, as an object of your meditation. So um, he wanted to know how to make sense of those two kinds of instructions. And what I said to him, um, which maybe it, uh, will be helpful, uh, is that in, in meditation, and the exercise I want to do with, is to reinforce this for people who haven't had a lot of instruction, in meditation we generally start out with a neutral object of awareness, which usually in Buddhist meditation is the sensation of the breath as it enters and leaves the nostrils or the belly as it rises and falls with the breath. So for some people, even watching the breath can have a lot of emotional uh, uh, overlay. Uh, but for most people, the breath is fairly neutral. So the, so the breath is like a, a place of refuge in the meditation. It's, some, it's a place that you can start out with. It's a place you can return to. It, it, there's some relationship between the breath as we use it and the transitional object uh, that Winnicott is talking about. Um, because of its, uh, the possibility of using it as a kind, in a kind of self-soothing way uh, and because of its neutrality. So what I was saying to the guy who asked me was that when, it, when intense emotional material comes up within the field of awareness in meditation, which it won't for everyone, but it can for anyone, and it probably will at some point. When it comes up, what, what, what I'm encouraging people to do is to make the emotional material an object of meditation also, and to train the bare attention, the non-judgmental mindful awareness that you've cultivated on the breath, to train it on the emotional material. But if that's too difficult, if and when it, the emotional material starts to hurt you the way your knees might, and you have an intuitive sense of when enough is enough, the breath is there to come back to. So the idea isn't that you know, in one meditation you're going to uh, blow out every leftover intense emotional uh, knot or klesha, a twisted aspect of yourself you know, that you've been carrying around. It, it, it's, it's you that you're dealing with. It's, gonna, it's still going to be there. It's not going to go away. Um, I have several sessions with patients just before coming up here where each person was like identifying an area of insecurity that was holding them back in their lives and hoping that we could just get rid of it, you know, once and for all, and then they would have good self-esteem and be confident and have all their energy and just be able to go forward. And in, for, with each person, I had to say, it is just not going to happen that way. You know, you're going to be dealing with this. You have to keep dealing with this. This is you. So it, similarly, with whatever kind of angers or hurt feelings or depressed feelings or anxieties, whatever tends to come up within the field of awareness as we practice meditation, you can make it an object, be with it, feeling how it changes <coughs> over time, how it... Uh, is displayed in your body, how it comes forward in your mind. Uh, and then when you get tired of it, or when enough is enough, you can come back to the breath. You can center yourself always on the breath. If whatever else is going on is too much, use the breath as your refuge. Okay? And we'll do a little meditation now. Starting with uh, meditation on the breath, and then opening the field up, uh, in the way that John Cage uh, suggests, and then we'll come back to the breath at the end. But if in the middle of it, re remember what I'm saying, you can experiment. It's up to you how you're deploying your attention. Okay. So if you, if you want to be with the breath, try to be with the breath. That's hard enough. It's not like it's so easy to keep your attention on the breath. You'll see, for those of you for whom it's new, you know, the mind will jump away whatever you try to do with it. 
the, the, the main metaphor is of the mind as like a monkey, you know, always jumping from branch to branch. So, or if you prefer the fish flapping on dry ground from earlier this morning. But, okay, so we're already in our meditative postures. The physical posture of setting your body onto the cushion, into the chair, allowing your mind to sit in the body as your body sits in the chair or on the cushion, relaxing your awareness onto the breath. Generally, there are two places you can make a choice right away. You can feel the sensation of the breath as it enters and leaves the nostrils, as if you're a doorman in a busy building watching the people file in and out. Or you can feel the abdomen rising and falling as you breathe in and out. And it's helpful to use a mental note or label to, t to keep your mind on the object. So when you breathe in, you can say the word in to yourself. When you breathe out, you can say the word out if you're watching at the nostrils. When you breathe in, you can say the word rising. When you breathe out, you can say the word falling if you're watching at the abdomen. Maybe the other way around, the, the abdomen, I always get confused what the diaphragm does. When you breathe in, when, what you breathe, when you breathe out. It doesn't really matter what words you use. But the bulk of your attention should be on the direct physical sensation of the breath. And then you may find, after the out-breath, before the next in-breath, there can be a pause where there's actually no movement, no breathing activity. And if you're watching at the nostrils, if you feel the sensation of your two lips touching, and repeat the words touching, touching to yourself, or if you're watching at the abdomen, if you just feel your buttocks against the cushion or your back against the chair and use that as the touch point, then the meditation becomes in, out, touching, touching, or rising, falling, touching, touching. Again, with the bulk of your attention on the direct physical sensation, that quality of bare attention, if the breath is very light, if you can hardly find it, or if the breath is very obvious, if it's thin, if it's coarse, doesn't matter. The actual instruction is to find whatever sensation or lack of sensation that comes with the breath. So even if there's nothing, you still have a vague sense that there's breathing going on. That's good enough. And if the attention wanders, if the mind jumps away, at a certain point, it may be just a couple of seconds later, or it may be five minutes later, but at a certain point, you'll realize, oh, wait a minute, what am I doing? Where, the breath? Where's the breath? Because you'll be thinking about, you know, putting your sheets out by the door. What did he say to, before breakfast? And, you, you know, um, you'll catch yourself at some point, oh, I'm not with the breath. In that moment, you have a choice. And when we're doing mindfulness of the breath, the choice is let go of wherever your mind has gone, acknowledge it, oh, thinking. But bring yourself back deliberately to the sensation of the breath. As if you were teaching a very young child. So not like uh, in an aggressive, hurtful way, not too impatient, but deliberately, firmly bringing yourself back to the breath. And just try this for a couple of minutes. Use the mental note or label. In, out, touching, touching, rise and falling, touching, touching. It's not an exercise in how long can you stay with the breath. It's not a competition. Just do your best when the mind wanders, notice that it's wandered, bring yourself back.
you know, for, for many people, this is the basic meditation practice. Using the breath as a the central object, developing concentration or one-pointedness on the breath. When the mind wanders, noticing where it goes and then bringing it back deliberately. And this concentration, one-pointed meditation builds up a capacity in the mind to hold experience no matter what it is. So you can never go wrong returning to this as a basic practice. For some people it may be very easy, it might come naturally. For other people they may already be judging themselves, criticizing themselves, you know, feeling insecure with it. I can't find the breath, I'm not doing it right. Everyone else knows how to do this, I don't know, I'm not comfortable. Just pay attention, those thoughts are just mere thoughts. If they come, you just see them as thoughts and then come back to the sensation or the lack of sensation however it appears to you. So at, at first, when you're practicing this kind of meditation, everything else that takes place, the sounds from the outside, your stomach rumbling, memories that you might be having, those judgmental thoughts, um, emotional memories of uh, anger or hurt feelings or whatever, uh, everything is a distraction. You know, Everything is like, oh, why is this happening? I'm supposed to be watching my breath. As you get more comfortable with the meditation, the challenge becomes to turn the distractions into objects of meditation themselves. So that this quality of bare attention, this quality of mindfulness that we cultivate on the breath as the central object, we learn to deploy that same kind of non-judgmental, open awareness to whatever is arising within the field. That doesn't mean that you can't still make choices about what you want to pay attention to. You could deliberately, for instance, to decide to just pay attention to sounds. And you could try that for a moment. Just listen to whatever surrounds you in the way of sound, even if it's silent. You'll see even in the silence there are variations in the texture of the silence. notice with the sounds that your mind likes to identify what the sounds are, you know, what's that rumbling sound? Is that the air conditioner or, you know, was that a car that went by? So that need of the mind to perceive, to identify, to uh, conceptualize what's happening, that's part of the mind's activity. And you can pay attention to that too without that spurring on a whole line of thought. So you can just see that happening, but then return to the bare attention of sounds rising and falling within the field of awareness. Or 
or you could put yourself totally in the visual field, even with your eyes closed. You could put the bulk of your attention just in whatever you're seeing behind your closed eyelids. Try that for a moment. The play of color or pattern or light or darkness. Just observe it. So when you're listening to sound, that's called putting attention on the ear door, because the ear, the ear drum is like the sense organ that is the boundary between our insides and the external world in terms of sound. When we're watching the, with the visual awareness, that's the eye door. The, sense, the sensory base is the eye itself. The object is whatever you're seeing. You could also make your, your kinesthetic awareness, your bodily awareness, you could make that the central focus of your meditation just by feeling whatever sensations or lack of sensations are happening throughout the body. without making the breath the center, but within the whole body. If there's itching, if there's warmth, if there's coldness, if there's pressure, if there's pain, too much pain and you should move, but if the pain is tolerable, sitting in one position, there will always be some discomfort. You can make the discomfort itself the central object. And in a similar way, you could make your mental activity, your thoughts or lack of thoughts. You can make your thoughts the object of meditation just by observing with that spy consciousness that we've been talking about already, by observing with bare attention the thoughts that come and go of their own accord, you will see. Thoughts without a thinker, that's the idea. Your minds may be relatively quiet now, but if you sit back and watch, you might, you might catch a thought or two like a shooting star across the sky. And then, of course, it's possible to make emotional reactions, objects of meditation, if you're feeling frustrated, if you're getting irritated, if you're having loving feelings, if you're having memories that have an affective and emotional tone to them. It's possible, again, to observe, watch, feel, listen to, 
the play of those emotional responses that happen, or their absence. I've been particularly moved over the years by John Cage, as I mentioned earlier, who primarily used sound as his object of meditation. And he gave very good little pithy instructions about how to do that. I'll read you a couple of them while, you, while you're meditating, while you're listening. He says, what I really like to listen to is whatever surrounds us in the way of sound. I really hear it as music. I've always tried to move away from music as an object, moving toward music as a process, which is without beginning, middle, or end. So that instead of being like a table or chair, the music becomes like the weather. If you develop an ear for sounds that are musical, he says, it is like developing an ego. You begin to refuse sounds that are not musical, and that way cut yourself off from a good deal of experience. If I liked music, he said, which I don't, the world would be more open to me. I intend to work on it. In Zen, they say, if something is boring after two minutes, try it for four. If still boring, try it for eight, 16, 32, and so on. Eventually, one discovers that it's not boring at all, but very interesting. In 1951, the great Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki came to Columbia to teach, and I went for two years to his classes. From Suzuki's teaching, I began to understand that a sober and quiet mind is one in which the ego does not obstruct the fluency of the things that come in through the senses and up through our dreams. Our business in living is to become fluent with the way we are living. And art can help this. So you can see you can jump from one sense area to another sense area that anything can become an object of meditation. It's possible if you relax into the awareness that's already there, that you can pay attention to the entire field so that whatever is most predominant be it the sounds, or be it the sensations, or be it the thoughts, or be it the emotions, or be it the breath, whatever is most predominant within your own field of awareness, you pay attention to that mindfully. Watching it as it shifts, feeling it as it shifts. So you can bounce from one to another. You don't have to stay within the confines of any particular domain. becomes possible to pay attention to the awareness that's there. So it's like backing off one, one other element. But it, you can be aware of the awareness itself.
just for the last couple of minutes, bring wherever you have gone, bring yourself back to the breath, wherever you are watching the breath, at the tip of the nose or in the abdomen. And let yourself use the mental note or label again. So in, out, touching, touching. And try counting also, so that after the out breath of the first breath, you say the word one. And after the out breath of the next breath, you say the word two. You go to 10 and then start over again. If you lose your place, you know, if you forget what number you're at, then start again at one. And it's just a way of keeping, sort of keeping track of what you're doing. Just before, before we start with the questions, I want to read you one more thing. Mm -hmm. I just want to read one more thing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so this is from uh, one of my Buddhist teachers, Jack Kornfield, who uh, now teaches mostly in California at a retreat center north of San Francisco called Spirit Rock. But he spent several years when he was in his 20s uh, in a Thai monastery, a Thai forest monastery, doing fairly intensive practice. Um, this kind of mindfulness practice over extended periods of time, working with a great teacher there named Ajahn Chah. <coughs> and uh, this is where he's writing, again, most personally about his own, the struggles that he's having with his own addictive cravings and um, his own desire and so on. And it's a condensed, he's making it seem as if he's writing about one, one hour of meditation, but he's really writing about two years of meditation. Okay, so don't, don't get the wrong idea if he makes it sound too easy. <coughs> that, watching the breath of the nose sometimes. So. <laughs> In my earliest practice as a celibate monk, writes Jack, I had long bouts of lust and images of sexual fantasy. My teacher said to name them, uh, which I did. By naming them, he means to label them, the way we were labeling the breath in and out. So it would be like lust, lust, you know. <laughs> My teacher said to name them, which I did. But they often repeated. Accept this, I thought, but then they'll never stop. But still I tried it. 
Over days and weeks, these thoughts became even stronger. Eventually, I decided to expand my awareness to see what other feelings were present. To my surprise, I found a deep well of loneliness almost every time the fantasies arose. It wasn't all lust, it was loneliness. And the sexual images were ways of seeking comfort and closeness. But they kept arising. So I'm going to keep going, but I just want to say there one important thing. It, he decided himself to expand his awareness to see what other feelings were present. So that, you're allowed to do that, okay? Like, to take that kind of initiative in your own meditation. You're doing it out of your own spirit of investigation and curiosity, okay? So you don't have to stay rigid to, you know, according to whatever form you think you're supposed to be doing. And then, of course, there's more there than meets the eye, which we know as, as therapists, usually. Um, and the thing about loneliness is interesting, given what we were talking about before, about the transitional object and so on, that these issues of separation and abandonment and loneliness and so on persist even in healthy, mostly healthy people. As the loneliness continued to arise, I brought more careful attention to where it was held. Mostly it felt centered in my stomach. Fear, pain, sadness, longing, and hunger were all present, along with a general aversion to feeling these states. I named each one softly. Then, while feeling into the center of the fire, pain, and hunger, I allowed whatever images wished to arise. So again, he's doing some version of what I was asking us to do, but shifting, you know, in the feelings, but then looking in the mind to see what's associated. So there's a kind of free association happening even within the mindfulness practice. There came a whole series of memories and pictures of abandonment and rejection. As I felt into this center, I asked myself what beliefs and attitudes I held about it. The story that came out sounded like a child who says, there's something insufficient and wrong with me and I will always be rejected. It was this belief, along with the attendant feelings, that I had identified with and contracted around. As each of these layers opened in awareness, the pain gradually eased, the feelings softened, and the fire subsided. As I continued to feel into the center of the loneliness, I seemed to sense a hole or space in my belly that the pain had closed around. I named the central hole softly and felt its deep hunger, longing, and emptiness. Then I let it open as much as it wanted, instead of closing around it as I had done for so many years. As I did, it got bigger and softer, and all the vibrations around it became very fine. The hole changed to open space, and its hungry quality shifted. Though it was empty, it became more like clear, empty space. Gradually, this filled more of my body, and with it, a sense of light and fulfillment arose. I was filled with a sense of ease and profound contentment and peace. Resting in this open space, the whole notion of rejection and insufficiency was totally unnecessary. I could see that all of it, the loneliness, pain, sadness, thoughts of rejection, was a contraction of my body and mind based on the frightened and very limited sense of myself that I had carried for a long time. That's, I think, one, one way of understanding the klesha, the twisted, uh, the twisted thing within. But here, resting in the spaciousness and wholeness, I knew it was not true. And while the pain of loneliness has certainly come again in my life, I now know for certain it is not who I am. So that, you know, as I said, that's a very condensed version. So that, that took place over a long period of time. But the, the revelation of it uh, is, I think, important that even after that experience, those feelings didn't go away for Jack. And I, you know, he wrote this probably 40 years ago. So, and I've been friends with him ever since, and I can testify that they still haven't gone away. But, but he, you know, he's a wonderful teacher. And, and, and I think what happens is that you, you begin to relativize, you know, or contextualize all that stuff that you took so seriously, that you take so seriously about yourself. 
It's not that, like um, uh, uh, Ramdas, I think, says, after all his years of practice, what, what once seemed like big demons, you know, uh, in his mind, now they're like delightful little schmoozes, you know. But uh, uh, these little schmoozes that he can say hello to, you know, he, he could, Ramdas, yeah. Uh, you, you develop a kind of sense of humor uh, and a sense of humility uh, about yourself. So instead of being, you know, uh, at odds with or ashamed of or, uh, you know, in some kind of uneasy relationship, a much more accepting uh, uh, attitude, which doesn't mean that you're not trying still to uh, be uh, um, as good a person as you can be, you know, as untroubled as, as you can be, but um, not pretending that uh, you're not still struggling with the same issues, okay? Um, so I have more more of that stuff with me. I can save it till tomorrow because we want to make some time for for questions. Well, Which, in his case, in uh, Jack's case, this loneliness thing. Yeah. What sort of thing in relation to Winnicott? Yeah. How would you connect that to his sort of uh, the cold self and all and the, yeah. and that space that you well, but how would you? Well, I think that, I think the fact that in his case it, it's. Um, built around sexual fantasy and lust, mm -hmm. first of all, is a, is a clue, uh, which I think is particular mm -hmm. to someone like Jack, where I, I would guess that in, in his early separation from uh, what I know he grew up with this kind of abusive father, and he, he, was, oh. he was a twin, so I, I would bet that he turned early to autoerotic, masturbatory uh, kinds of um, activities uh, that he tried to use as a self-soothing transitional object kind of thing, but uh -huh. that he always felt um, ashamed of or guilty about. I bet that he, you, you know, that he had a thing about his his sexual drive, his sexual desire being, you know, unwholesome, unhealthy, right. lustful, etc. So mm -hmm. that so, he, but that underneath that is this loneliness that he never really confronted, never really dealt with. Um, so, uh, uh, but then what he's finding through the practice is that um, that conclusion that he came to, that, you know, there's something irretrievably wrong with me that makes me unlovable, that's like a Winnicottian false self kind of notion, you know, because he thinks he knows who he is, but uh, he's made up this explanation that then is driving him. So um, Winnicott talks a lot about how when there's early developmental trauma, when the parents are either too intrusive or too abandoning, the child develops a, a kind of caretaker self, a false self, that is primarily lodged in the thinking mind. He talks about a kind of flight uh, upwards uh, into the psyche away from the soma. So this kind of... Uh, demonization of the bodily desires and uh, excessive mental uh, conclusion. I think you see that here, mm -hmm. too. And then the meditation itself is opening him to something that he didn't know was there, you know, mm -hmm. which was uh, himself, you know, his own, his own heart, uh, to use language that, that Jack tends to like. But I think a capacity of, uh, for uh, connection or for love that uh, was already there in him, but had been squashed, you know, um, g given the, the, the meditation created enough, enough space that it could start to um, uh, blossom. Does yeah. that make sense? Thank you. <coughs> is, it, is it my turn? Uh, it's your turn. <laughs> but I want to stop at 9 o'clock. Yeah. Too late last night for everybody to get sleep yoga. So, uh, um, I'm going to a little bit change gear first for a little while, then we'll do some Q&A. Although, someone did have a question for me earlier at lunch, and I said to ask it at the beginning of a session so everybody could hear it. Was that you? You had a question for me at lunchtime? Wasn't that you? You said you wanted to clarify something. Can you repeat it? And I hope I'll be able to understand you. I have a problem with it, hearing Although I have lots of spare parts. <laughs> <laughs> I really hear the sound. 
I was I was just um, asking for more clarification on the difference between the dual and the non-dual tradition and how they related to reincarnation. Okay. Uh, I don't think they make any difference about reincarnation. I think both, in, these you're talking about the Buddhist dual and non-dual tradition. That is, uh, Theravada is one version of the dualist tradition. There's also a tradition called Mahasangika. Theravada had like eight or eight or ten kinds, and uh, another eight were in a larger grouping called Mahasangika, larger community. So the tradition of the elders and larger community. Theravada is the one that, that survived in Sri Lanka. After in Sri Lanka they purged due to some politics between two successors to the throne. One who backed the long-established Mahayana monastery and even Vajrayana, Tandrayana monastery in Sri Lanka. And one who backed a very sort of stringent <coughs> Theravada where they didn't like the Mahayana. And the, the successor who was backing the Theravada one won the contest and they destroyed the, the other one. So then, then Sri Lanka suddenly became only exclusively Theravada, which it had not been. And, and then India collapsed, kind of, Buddhism collapsed in India around a thousand years ago. And the sort of synthesis between dualists and non dualists that had existed already for about a thousand years uh, was lost. And then from Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, and so on, they all became very orthodox Theravada. Uh, once Sri Lanka had all, you know, had sort of rigidified around that. Uh, there's really no difference. And the, as I said, in dealing with the Four Noble Truths, the uh, fact that actual reality is nirvana, which makes, you know, all of the, both the path, the suffering and the cause of suffering and the path to the freedom from cause of suffering, all on the relative truth or relative reality level. And all of their actuality being actually nirvana, because third noble truth is the only one that is what they call paramartha satya, or actual reality, which means it's the reality here and now. You know? And also in the dualist tradition, uh, they say or they also say nirvana is uncreated. Uncreated means it's always been here. So it's not it's not like actually there's a basis in the way the the, in the dualist tradition, focusing on withdrawal from the world and monasticism, there's not really a basis for the dualistic idea that nirvana is somewhere else. And furthermore, even in the, uh, I'm the fan that drafted, suddenly got my sign of I'm sorry about my voice. And uh, <coughs> temperature drops in the mountains in the evening. And uh, Furthermore, the Buddha from the very beginning in dualistic thing, uh, dualistic Theravada Buddhism and in Mahayana Buddhism, he taught something called the four, what people usually say formless realms, but they're actually immaterial realms, which would be better translation. Above the realms of pure form, which are the upper divine realms, there are actually uh, 22, four, 26 different heavens, at least. In the, in the Buddhist uh, elaboration of the God realms. It isn't just one realm, there's 22 of them. And six in the desire realm, 16 in the uh, realm of pure matter, and then four in the realm of, of uh, immaterial realm. And the immaterial realms are the, called the realm of infinite space, the realm of infinite consciousness, the realm of absolute nothingness, and the realm, in a way, they, the word we call realm, I shouldn't say realm, the medium, Medium of infinite space, medium of infinite consciousness, medium of absolute nothingness, and medium beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. And then the Buddha, those are four states that Buddha attained, that yogis attained, either Hindu or Buddhist, there's no difference, in the ability to attain that. And Buddha clearly said, none of those are nirvana. And they are realms that would seem separate from the realms of matter, and the desire realm, where, where the human realm is located, and six of the, of the godly heavens are located. And he said, so those would be sort of separate places, in the sense of their attainable media. The realm is wrong because it's spatial, and there's no matter, so you don't need space. Infinite space means somehow space becomes meaningless, you know, right? And then it, it's infinite consciousness, you know. 
And uh, there's a very clear warning that it gives in dualistic Buddhism as well as non-dualistic Buddhism that none of those are nirvana and they're actually considered to be traps. Because when you go in them, if you're not forewarned, then naturally you think you've reached the absolute infinite space. Come on. And then your consciousness is everywhere in the space when you go more subtle. And when that's more subtle, you kind of blank out in a vast, uh, not dark, unconsciousness. And you think you're obliterated, and that's all fit, and no more suffering. Because you don't really exist, you have a sensation as if you don't exist. And then that even seems a little bit confining to an extremely sensitive, refined yoga who can achieve that. And then you go into the state of beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, where you sort of almost, it's almost like enlightenment. It's sort of, it's, it's dualistic, non-dualistic, because you have, you encompass both things, you know. And yet it's not nirvana, it's not enlightenment, he says. So, Mahayana simply takes what is hinted at in the dualistic one, because then the Buddha knows that many people in the dualistic one, especially male Brahmins and Kshatriyas, who were the majority of his monastic disciples in the early period, and they are going to, whatever he says, they're still into escapism, and they want to get out of it. So they're going to think of it, and actually in certain areas of the Theravada commentarial tradition, they kind of posited nirvana as beyond the fourth state of consciousness, of consciousness. Actually wrongly, controversially, but they did. As if it was even more obliterated. Those weren't nirvana because they weren't obliterated enough. And if you get trapped in them, you become what's called a deity of the formless realms, or a deity of the immaterial realms, where you kind of have no obvious body, you're just a vast state of mind, kind of. Like that's the medium. And you kind of, and the reason it's a trap is your evolution toward perfect enlightenment and the bliss of perfect enlightenment, with which you can compassionately help all beings, which a Buddha wants to do. That bliss is, your opportunity to reach there is, is immensely delayed, you know, for aeons and aeons. And you're like the guy at the end of Walden. I don't know if you remember, if you read the Rose of Walden? you ever read that? There's a guy who wants to make a, a gift of someone of the perfect walking stick, and he spends like half an aeon finding the right tree, and half an aeon, I don't know whether he's a god or what, I don't remember how he can spend such a time. Then he carves it and all this, and by the time he finishes, he doesn't recognize anyone in the planet, and he doesn't know who it is, the person who's going to give it to is gone. So, so I don't know where Thoreau got that, maybe from the Yoga Vashista or one of the Puranas, I know, Hindu sort. And for, finally, furthermore, in the individual vehicle, like, which I call, I never call it lesser vehicle, I call it individual vehicle. Because it's a vehicle of seeing where the one Christ seeks enlightenment for oneself, which is logical. First you should get enlightened, then you can help others. And it doesn't, it sort of doesn't think of itself as you're going to bring everybody with you, kind of, all at once, like the Bodhisattva vehicle. So that's why I call it individual vehicle and universal vehicle, because the universal vehicle needs individual vehicle which is really the way they related historically, actually, until you got sort of modern period where they lost track of what the other one was. But the other thing is that in the individual vehicle, Buddha told all his past lives in, in relation to reincarnation, infinite previous incarnations, right? And there's a famous set of 500, but they're actually more like a thousand. I don't know if anybody ever added them all up. His reference to all kinds of things that happened in previous lives. And in those lives, he's called a bodhisattva. Right? He's the Bodhisattva, when he's the king of the deer, when he's the monkey king, when he's this and that, the other turtle, all kinds of, every animal practically. Walt Disney's like fondest dreams, he realizes, <laughs> in his Jataka tales. As but then, in the dualistic vehicle, he never says, oh, you guys are going to do the same thing. You all got to be Bodhisattvas in front of lives, and then you'll develop the teaching ability and the sort of vast awareness of a Buddha. And uh, later, when a few of them, and then mostly in India, when the individual vehicle was very well established after Ashoka, and no king in India dared confiscate land from monasteries, they all vied with each other to support them and sustain them. The monks were in Ashoka's edicts on stone, so there's no doubt about them. He doesn't refer to them as the Buddhist community. He refers to Brahmins, uh, he refers to Jains, he refers to uh, nirgrantas, naked yogis, 
and he supports all of them. And then he refers to the community as the main people he supports, the Sangha. He doesn't have to say Buddhist, because they're so well established in India. So then, when they get really well established, then they bring out the Buddhas more, let's say, immediately um, aggressive, maybe you would say, social teaching. Like, it's not only for the monks to seek enlightenment. You lay people, get off your butts and start doing it. It's not like the monks are at a higher level and you go over and make offerings to them and you enjoy their good vibes and so forth when they come to get their free lunch from you. But you love to give them and you feel it's a great merit. That's not enough. You have to start learning, meditating, being helpful to others. You're all going to become Buddhas. And even those monks who are arhats, arhats are great, they're liberated, they're calm, they're peaceful. But they still didn't deal with their primal rage, their teeth gnashing, they're unconscious. They're consciously enlightened. And they've had meditative experiences like that, but they don't yet have the thing where they have become one with all the other people. And therefore, they're completely aware of what those other people feel, and therefore what they need to teach them, to help them. And teaching is the main way of liberating them. There's no other way, because the only way you get liberated is your own understanding. So therefore, you know, among the generosities in both vehicles, uh, the highest gift is the gift of teaching, not the gift of material things, and not the gift of protection, which are the two other kinds of giving. But the gift of material thing, of teaching is the highest by far, because that's what empowers the recipient. They gain a new understanding, they enter a new world by their new realization that you can help them do by providing them the tools with which to learn. Okay? Now, in regard to reincarnation or rebirth, uh, the, uh, we, we like to use the word reincarnation for some high-level bodhisattvas or Buddhas who are consciously able to take rebirth by picking a nice womb in a good neighborhood where they'll be able to go to the local Dharma Center and their mom will show them how to behave when they're young. And when they make that extra space, she'll be helping them with the Dharma because the first teacher of everybody is the mother. Right? So that's what we call that reincarnation. The other is called rebirth, where your unconscious drags you toward whatever you lust for. You know, and you... And then the book, do you know the Book of the Dead? Did you ever look at the Book of the Dead? Or any of the studies around that? And I do recommend my introduction to my translation. The other translations are fine, but I like my introduction to that. <laughs> and, and the thing about it is that um, there's like a technology of understanding the process of life and death. And the yogis who get into Tantra, which is the best way of going to the unconscious, actually, it's really... That was unpacked another 500 years after the tradition had become really strong. Most of the Indian kingdoms were demilitarized. Women were pretty much honored and strong. They weren't like in the extended family, where in Buddha's time they still were trapped. And then when you had female monasticism, they trampled all the male monks, and so many of them tried to be nuns. And as Buddha predicted, the males in the Indian society began to become intolerant of the female monasticism because they were losing their slaves, you know, because the women were basically their slaves like they still are on this planet, more or less, you know, here in the California, but even California, where you don't have the ERA in America, supposedly greatly advanced America, ERA was never ratified, right? It would have to be repassed through the thing. And with Paul Ryan, good luck. <laughs> good luck. So I hope you all get out and vote. Get rid of those jerks. <laughs> so, all the coke brother obstructors, you know, who have not, do not serve the people of our country, and who have all self-impeached, actually, because they don't genuinely take an oath of office to serve us or the Constitution. So, so both are totally into rebirth. And actually, I'm glad you, that was, I didn't remember that was the question, but I'm glad you, you asked that, because that's what, that's what I wanted to get into, because I wanted to talk about depression. At dinner, Rita asked me, Rita and Carolyn <coughs> asked me, did I think depression was genetic? And you know, our wonderful corporate, commercial, industrialized medical system is really have high hopes. Uh, they did have high hopes with their genome thing, and they're still promoting that to some extent. Although, although they did analyze everything. They found out we're a bunch of chips, 
basically we have one or two extra genes. Otherwise, we're like, <sighs> that's about it for our genome. <laughs> Not only that, but the bacteria in our stomach, there's a billion other genes in there from other animals who live in us. Who are like, well, hello, <laughs> let's do your genome. It's like billions of them. And they discovered that. And then they're, they're running around taking resort to epigenetics. What is it that triggers the gene? You know? But they're still acting all like they have charge with the genes. And then they're going you know, to sell you better genes than them in their ultimate goal, because they all work for commercial companies. Because <laughs> they're all corrupted. And uh, that's their, their goal. And uh, their worst act lately that I think is they got poor Angelina to hack off her breasts. It's a ridiculous thing I can't even, I can't even imagine. I'm so pissed off about it. She hacked off both breasts because she has some gene that somebody said, oh, that could make breast cancer. You know, it's like all these women with no, with, who had breast, breastoctomies or whatever you call it, and mammoctomies. What are they? And then they took out all the lymph glands just for fun. And then in the New York Times it said they didn't need to take a lymph gland. And I was hoping there would be an irate mob of females down there at the, at the Sloan Kettering and Beth Israel and Columbia Presbyterian demanding reinstallation. <laughs> Where's my lymph node? Or make a, make a fake one. What do you guys took all my lymph nodes? What did, what, did you sell them? Where are they? Where's my lymph node? Are they in the freezer? Please reinstall. But they didn't materialize. Nobody went out and asked for reinstallation. I was very depressed. Very depressed. So anyway, they asked me about depression. So I want to give you a little, a little scenario for depression. God doesn't exist. You are a random mutation and a total cosmic accident. You are in a, on a planet that's maybe the only one where there's a couple of weird human beings crawling around by total accident. Carl Sagan sent out Beatles music and Mozart, and he's hoping to get some echo. Aldebaran or something, but otherwise it's a big mystery that there would be other life anywhere. But, but the fact there is this life is utterly meaningless. You are utterly meaningless. And when you die, that's the end of you, which means actually you right now you're nothing but a biological robot that hasn't had a proper stamp on you of made in Silicon Valley or something. And you have to say the guy at Stanford hasn't made you into a Singularity <laughs> robot yet, made of, they assured me, not metal, not like Tin Man, but nice soft plasma. You know what I mean? And you'll be a perfect immortal robot. And he's, you take a lot of vitamins to last to 2045. And then you can just turn on the thing and have sex for, for eternity. Uh, two, two robots clanking together. <laughs> Inexhaustible. Inexhaustible. But that's what, that also is going to be meaningless. And you have no purpose in life. And anything good that you achieve is going to be wasted because you'll be nothing. So you might as well go out and uh, join Donald Trump and make a casino. <laughs> be a high roller. What's the use? It's pointless, useless. You destroy the planet. Never mind. Once they're all dead and they never knew they lived, then it was meaningless anyway. Just destroy the whole dead thing. That's, how is that for a depressing view of life? <laughs> what do you think? And get everything you can get out of this life right away. Go to a Zen center and get enlightened, luckily, in one or two years if you make good bread, you know, for the future. <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's totally depressing. It is an absolute psychotic and totally illogical, utterly irrational worldview, and we all have this worldview, including me. I don't think I'm, I know, don't think I really live as if I'm going to have a future life. Mainly, I'm still infected by the common sensual reality, the consensual reality of our society, which is you have one life, and that's all it is, and it's meaningless. So have a ball, have a blast, go for it, be addicted. Why not? You know, take more, take a higher dose. Like Tim Leary, remember the great psychedelic guy, he ended up saying, it doesn't matter what you take, heroin, cocaine, you don't have to take sacred psychedelics, it's just that you have to take enough of whatever it is, because the, the enlightenment is in the drug. He is totally sold out mentally to that. Yep. So how is that for depression? A couple of genes might help, <laughs> but that's depressing enough. <laughs> What's 
the point? You know, you don't need to go to the Zen Center. Just shoot yourself. Seriously. Shoot. Pain, painless. Call Jack the work here. That's it. And there's no problem. And you don't regret that you didn't have another vegan dinner because <laughs> you never remember that you ever existed. Because you don't really exist. Wait, those people who tell you you will not exist just by dying are telling you you don't exist right now. And the people who are real fanatics, they have, still have a little psychotic space in the center of the thing. That's the real them. But in their case, instead of a little soul that's going to hop up and go meet Yahweh up there on the Mount Sinai, up, in, up over Mount Sinai, and hop up with him, but they're a little spark of Yahweh, at least they have Yahweh to go to. That's so much better for monotheists. They're way better off. Actually, although they get silly and they do inquisitions and fanatics and burn, burn witches, because they're also psychotic. But they're at least psychotic in a slightly nice way. <laughs> but these nihilists are totally psychotic in a completely unredeemable manner. And the people under their spell, which is all of us, how we were raised, where did we get our reality view? From churches, synagogues, from Dharma centers? No, we got it in science classes. They made us cut up a frog. <laughs> Because they're robots too. <laughs> and we were sensitive little kids, we didn't want to cut up a frog. Oh no, you're gonna cut up a frog. So you don't pass your biology. <laughs> so what do you suggest? <laughs> I suggest you criticize that worldview and free yourself from it. And the first way to start is this. Whoever discovered nothing, and why do they expect a Nobel Prize for that? I like to know. Oh, I discovered nothing. That's where we're all going. Whoever discovered nothing. And my thing to did Carl Sagan show up after your dad's death and say, it's cool, guys, I don't exist. Any of those people in MIT, Harvard, or Columbia, and the Natural Science Department, after they died, did they come back and say, it's cool, you won't exist after death. We did have the right worldview, did they? Not only they didn't, but nobody ever will. Nothing is something you can't discover. Because, hey, geniuses, it doesn't exist. It's not there. It's not a dark space. It's not, there's no such thing as nothing. So no one can become nothing. Your mental energy is a continuum. And it will continue. When you, you know, you can go into, you can program yourself into a computer. You could, but that's kind of cold and creepy. And you have, you have to pay Google to be in their server. server so so you, what you do is, you're used to having a body and to running around this and that. And when you die, you go through, through the clear light. Through, you go down through, it's very, it's very well worked out. These yogis did it. They, you know, you know about lucid dreaming? I'm sure you know about lucid dreaming. You know about lucid dreaming, right? Where you can train yourself to be aware that you're dreaming and stay in the dream and then learn something in the dream. So these people in India, and they developed advanced inner science, that left the European people in their dark ages in the total dust, which is where they still are, actually. Now they're just making the planet into dust. We are. And they lucidly die. And they notice how it happens, and how it works, out, and how you leave the central nervous system, the continuum of your consciousness, and then how you are attracted. And they had, a, they had an Oedipal experience, or an Electra experience, before you were conceived. You know, that's what you do when you die. Like Jack Hornfield had all this lust in his stomach. <laughs> if Jack Hornfield died at that time, Jack Hornfield, because I think he was from New York too. Everybody's from the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and he's he, cruising Fifth Avenue. And then you have a subtle body so you can see through walls. And then they, in New York City, there might be 10,000 couples getting it on in any one evening. Okay? And you cruise and take all the couples. And your stomach is going crazy because you don't have a stomach. So you just are a little ball of lust. And you're zapping down the Fifth Avenue, Third Avenue, or maybe you go to the Bronx, and mom and dad, are really, they don't know they're going to be mom and dad. They're not ready to pay a quarter million dollars to Harvard to deal with this thing after prep school and high school. So mom and dad are getting it on, not realizing that when they get a little lost in orgasm, they're going to be opening their channels, and somebody else might show up. <laughs> they don't have to register. <laughs> and, and, they, 
And if you're going to be female, you really like dad. And if you're going to be male, you really like mom. And you could sort of do without dad. You could replace dad, or you could replace mom. Freud would have had ecstasy over a pre preconception inappropriate mm. experience. <laughs> but it's just pure lust, so you can't tell what neighborhood you're going to hit. You don't know where you're going to go. And if you have idolized armadillos in the previous life, or you have been in love with crocodiles, or whatever, deers, you might end up liking mom and dad deer, and you might be reborn at a subhuman level, according to your unconscious, assuming wrongly that they have more fun with having sex, which would be wrong. That's one of the things humans have an edge on all the animals. They really do. You know, they, they show those monkeys because they always like running around you know, the head monkey beats up the other males and goes around, whatever. But that's really, it's, it's, there's hardly any foreplay. It's really boring. It's just like, uh, and then they cut off. <laughs> like nothing. No foreplay, nothing. No, like, nothing nice. Humans have a great time. Very soft and everything. So, this is depression. This is the source of depression. It's distorted, anti-religious worldview. And in a way, I'm all for them being anti-religious, actually. I like that. I don't like religion myself. And I hate the Inquisition. I hated the witch burning. You know, I hated a bunch of really crazy stuff they did. And they did have their dark ages for a long time. That guy Clement of Alexandria was an archbishop. He wasn't the Muslims. He wasn't Donald Trump's like, like hate squad that destroyed the Library of Alexandria. It's a bunch of fanatic Christians. An archbishop who killed Hypatia, the great female mathematician of the third century of the Common Era, and then they took away everybody's mushrooms and their Eleusinian mysteries that they were doing in the Delphic Temple. And they like put them all on, you know, put all like, you know, cast iron jock straps and, and whatever you call the female version. And they, and they had the nice dark ages and then like a Middle Ages, and they all slept in the same room and they ate crappy bread and they threw the bones to the dogs or on the floor with them. And no wonder they had Oedipal crises. <laughs> they all a bunch of psychos. No, no, it's not time. I'm answering your question. You asked me what to do. <laughs> so I'm telling you. That was you. not an answer. What? What? It's what? not an answer. Not an answer? No, well, but you don't want to think about it. I think about it all the time. Well, I'm what's wrong? Very, Did very you think this about it? You think that I'm you have a great... Critical. You think you have a great culture, maybe. You have a really bad... In my college that I've been teaching at for 50 years. They think they have PhDs, and they're the greatest, smartest human beings that ever walked on this planet. They do. And anything ancient person discovered is backward, pre-modern, underdeveloped. They don't have Ford motor cars. They don't have nuclear weapons. And they are deluded. This culture is destructive. It's not just Donald Trump. It's just Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> it's not just he's destructive. This culture is destructive. We are destroying the planet. Would you like to think about that? In our meaninglessness, we are destroying it. Okay? So that doesn't make us superior. That does not make us superior. Anyway, I'm not just talking to you. It's not that doesn't make us superior. That makes us inferior, actually. We are the bullies on the planet. We have been. Okay? We should face that. And we should realize that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to rediscover the mind. We should learn from cultures that had highly developed cultures, had greater wealth than we did, and didn't use it to conquer the world, be colonialists, commit genocide all over the place. There are cultures like that, and we should learn from those cultures. And the first lesson to learn that's really a big difference, the really biggest difference is, what you do in this lifetime will matter to you forever. You will be reborn. If you've been a pain in the neck and nasty to people, you will have a very difficult time. There's no question. Just like if you're nasty to yourself as an addict and depressed, you will have a difficult time later in this life. If you, if you live the American way, couch potato, eating, go to McDonald's, super, super size me, you know, drive your car, don't walk, don't do yoga, don't eat decent food, let them kill the chickens wildly, bring their necks, destroy the cattle, destroy the planet, and you just sit there like America way, you have a bad time in the future of this life. That causality will continue. And in future life, you will have difficulties. Nobody personally is going to send you to hell. And I'm happy with the scientists 
that they got Galileo and, and they saved people from being tortured in the Inquisition. I even like Napoleon because Napoleon actually, although he did a lot of nasty wars, everywhere he went he destroyed the torture chambers of the Inquisition. I don't know why. Maybe he had an uncle who was tortured by <laughs> aunt or something. I don't exactly didn't investigate, but that's an amazing thing that nobody knows. In the Vatican, they had a special little sorcery thing, getting after Napoleon, because he wrecked their power in Europe, actually. Everywhere he conquered, he destroyed their power. So the big change is that, you know, the power now, Mr. Eckhart, he tells people nicely, and I like him very much, uh, Toma, Eckhart Toma, that you don't forget about the past and future, and you just be in the now, and be in the moment, and you're okay. But you know whose people are most in the moment? Alzheimer's patients are very much in the moment. <laughs> they, really, they don't have to read Eckhart Tolle. They just, they don't remember it two minutes ago, and they don't worry about the next one. They're just in the moment. And their relatives get very upset with them, not because they don't know who they are, but maybe they didn't, maybe they wanted to forget. So that doesn't help by itself. When you are gripped by a nihilistic culture that tells you that you're going to escape into nothingness, <coughs> just by dying, and what you've done, and the effort of study, and learning, and self-transcendence, and overcoming addictions, and overcoming depression, is going to be lost when you die, and you why make an effort. You know? The point is, you, the primary addiction is to your delusion. Secondary addiction is to your greed. Third addiction is to your anger and hostility. Those are the primary addictions. Then there are secondary ones to jealousy, pride, arrogance, hypocrisy, pretension, all kinds, of, they have like long lists of them. And then that, those, those addiction lists fit down in tantric science into the 80 instincts that exist in the subtle mind, just which you would only really find before death in a normal life. But if you want to be a real yogi, if you want to be a real psychologist and psychoanalyst, you can find those things in, while you're alive and you can free yourself from being driven by your unconscious. The big difference between Buddhist psychology and modern psychology, although the pioneers of modern psychology who are doing that, such as my esteemed and beloved colleague, Mark. But the big difference is that you're not content in Buddhist psychology to die with your unconscious still unconscious, because your unconscious will determine your rebirth. Back to your original thing. It'll be dragged by impulses that you can't control into places you might not necessarily want to go. And so it becomes a vital death and life, or let's say death and rebirth, struggle to become really conscious and to be able to use your deep unconscious eros and thanatos and not be controlled by them, but you control them so that you don't get carried away as a killer and be reborn as a lion or a tiger, or you don't get carried away by lust and be reborn as some kind of inconceivable creature with like lots of different extra organs or something. Seriously. So, so this is a shift, you know, Oprah experienced a big shift with Eckhart Tolle, which was good. And she, because she got in the moment, so she felt the earth move. I don't know if you remember that. And then she had all these great teachings for him, which I'm sure was helpful for a lot of people's anxiety. So it was a good thing. But the bigger shift is where you come into the moment, which is where you are now, and that moment has this, is the seed of an infinite future, an endless future. And in that endless future, you are entwined with all the other beings, because they also happen. And then you are, you, that moment becomes the, the space in which you, you become committed to making that moment better, for even in the tiniest little bit for everyone as well as yourself, because you're totally entwined with all of them forever. Because you'll be born and born and born, and you'll be born unconsciously, driven by subconscious impulse and instinct, which will, and you don't know where that will take you. Whereas if you use your special human intelligence, which is your greatest possible purpose of your human life, to find out about your unconscious, to make it conscious, to use your, starting with mindfulness, to descend down and see what's really going on at the deep level and learn to just move away from this one and let that one go that way and repurpose the other one 
and shape yourself, your own being, and your own unconscious energies, and get those energies and then use them for the positive. Become an artist of your life, realizing you're a work in progress. You have no fixed self. You have no fixed soul. You are going to make a better soul for yourself and all other beings. Then you have a meaningful life. Then depression leading to suicide. Why would you kill yourself? They kill themselves because they think they're getting out of the problem. But if when you kill yourself, you go with the same emotional angst, depression, freak out that you have while you're alive, and at least you can deal with it with the body. You can go get a pill. You can go get some, you know, have an eat dessert. You can talk to a friend. Well, if you lose that body, you don't know which body you're going to go into in this deep, like, well, I hate everybody and everybody hates me. And it's not worth living. Life is not worth living. You know, like Eckhart Tolle himself. He got so into the moment because he found an inner monologue was telling him everything was worthless and he might as well kill himself. And then he said he found a second inner voice. And that inner voice said, hey, why am I listening to you? <laughs> like, what, what, who, what are you telling me? Life is not worth living. You're just one side of my Eckhart Tolle personality. He did photo psychosynthesis. You know, he found another voice. I mean, he didn't do it, I think, on purpose. He just naturally did it because he has a great affinity. He's a great teacher. He's a wonderful person. But he hasn't really addressed I told him over Italian pasta and said, uh -huh. I urged him, get that moment, make that a moment of eternity, not a moment of escape for your vast readership, and you'll do them a huge favor. And then instead of using their sort of being the power of the now to escape for a brief moment into a preview of the nothingness they expect to escape in you when they die, make that moment eternity. And make it that if that moment can be one tiny bit better for themselves or another person, they don't mind paying attention to that. They didn't just say, oh, I don't worry about it now. Oh, I don't worry about the future. I don't anticipate the future. I don't remember the past. I'm just here. And that's great. And what could be greater than this? Instead of that, something could be greater than this. Even if they're great, somebody else could be greater. Some starving person, somebody in Syria could be greater. Definitely. And they could do something about it if they're feeling really great. In that moment. So please do that. I asked him, he said, Oh, yeah, I'll do that, Bob. That's a good, you're right. That's a good idea. But I, I, I don't know, I have, maybe, he's done, maybe he's written a book. I don't know. So I wanted to get into this because I want you to meditate. Like you fall asleep at night and then you have your yoga of the, of the clear light, the men are sleeping yoga, right? You have that. And then you wake up, however. And if you fall asleep in a really good mood, making your prayers, your meditations, your mindfulness, your thoughts of kindness, you review your day, things you did that were a little less than nice, or something you regret that, you decide you would be especially nice the next, to, to that person again the next day, etc. Cetera, et cetera, you know, you do things like that. You, know? you don't have to just sit down like now, I lay me down to sleep and all that. But you do something like that. And then you go in and you, you say, I want, to, I want to be in the clear light, and then maybe while my body's in the clear light, I'll have a beautiful dream, and then uh, that dream will inspire me in the morning. Then you wake up better in the morning. You will. You'll have a better next day. You'll do that. So that's what you're doing in your, with your life. You're preparing for endless lives. And then even, I would say this, and this is, will be a shock to everybody. Buddha also doesn't just escape. Buddha doesn't stop. They always say, Buddha, no more birth. The Arhat say that all the time. I've done what I had to do. Life is over. No more rebirth, etc. They mean no more rebirth driven by the unconscious. Buddha doesn't need to be reborn. Buddha is infinite. He's everybody, one with everybody. And actually, he sees us all as basically blissful. He does. Even we're bomb, dropping a bomb, he sees us as blissful. Even people are burning, he sees them as blissful. But they themselves are all like, their relative reality, their illusory reality, is all disordered and terrible, horrible. So he also, unfortunately, sees that. So he manifests to put out the fire, to help people infinitely. Buddha doesn't stop. Life is infinite. One of his names is Amitayus, which means infinite life. Because love and compassion make you infinite for the sake of those who need your compassion and need your love. That's what it does. And you didn't create the world. They never say Buddha is omnipotent, creator, or God. In a way, they do say he's God of gods, but he's not a creator of God. And yet, 
a Buddha, he or she, or it, whatever it is, is a force of love, ultimately, that never gets tired of dealing with us and comes to help us no matter what. And so that's also endless. So if you think about it, if you're here, like here we are tonight, and we're, we're, you know, we're leaving tomorrow, everybody is, and we're going our separate ways. And maybe some of us are friends, and we know each other, and we meet each other again, okay? But we don't necessarily think we're not each other's mothers and fathers. But in this view, everyone has had beginningless lives. I've been, every single person here, including you, I've been your mother in a previous life. And I forgive you. Also, <laughs> you've been my mother in a previous life, and I apologize. Many <laughs> lives, because we've all had infinite past lives. So therefore, everyone has been our mother, actually. And now, when you're a Buddha, they say, a Buddha is a being who perceives every living being, not just the human ones, every human being, as a mother perceives her only beloved child. In other words, selflessly, identifying completely with that being. And so, think about it. You're, we're all going to be here together forever. Do we want to keep being each other's mothers and worry about our children getting depressed, addicted, and anxious, and having to be anxious about them? Would we like them all to be free of suffering and enlightenment? And would we like to be free of suffering and enlightenment? Of course. The ideal universe called the Buddha land in non-dualistic Buddhism, which they, they say it a little bit indirectly to the arhats in the dualistic Buddhism. The Buddha has sutras about what the world was like in the ancient time. He has a cosmogony. He has indirect things hinting about this. But the ideal land is the land where everybody loves everybody else. Do you dig that one? I do. Sometimes I call it the food fight universe. Okay? Earlier tonight, I stole one piece of watermelon from Carolyn's plate. And I really liked it, and I ran back and I grabbed five pieces of watermelon. Okay? In a Buddha land, if you, what you would do is you would be wanting everybody else to have all your watermelon. But then the lucky thing is, they'd all be wanting you to have their watermelon. So it would be everyone piling watermelon on each other. And what is it we do? Well, I want my watermelon. Don't take my chocolate. Don't take my watermelon. Don't take it. I've got my thing. Because with the opposite, the, the, the samsara land is everybody out for number one. And everybody failing to really do that good a job for number one. Look at that guy. That guy is a Dharma teacher. Donald Rump? <laughs> Donald Rump is a darn teacher. Because he's standing up there as the big megalomaniac. And he can't talk about anything else but, you know, I'll be really great. And I am really great. And I'm really great. And I'm really great. And I'll be so great. And it'll be so great. That's all he can say. That's, that's it. It's all his. It's all him. And there's nothing else in the whole world. And I have a good joke for you, which you can go to sleep on. I'm going to stop because it's 9 o'clock. He's against all immigrants, right? But he's been married to three immigrants exactly. from Central Europe. Which goes to show that there are some jobs Americans just won't do. <laughs> <laughs> have a good sleep. Okay, thank you very much. Use that when you have a Go to every coffee shop and make sure Hillary gets elected. That's a target.